Jeff's, Jeff's with us in Phoenix. Hey, Jeff, how are you? I'm well, Dave. Thank you for your time today, sir. Sure. How can I help? Well, I have a question about 401k for retirement. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw a, show, a documentary on PBS, and it kind of showed some pretty compelling evidence that uh, investing for retirement in 401ks, because of all the fees that are associated with it, that over like 50 years it can erode, those fees can erode like two-thirds of your original investment. And they strongly advised uh, the advantages of being in something called a market index fund mm-hmm. versus mutual fund. Mm-hmm. So I guess my question is twofold. Exactly what is a market index fund, and what's your opinion on it, which one I should be in for retirement? Okay. Um, a market index, an index is anything that models, um, an index fund is anything that models a one of the particular indexes. A good best way to do it is give you an example. The S&P 500 is an index. The Dow Jones Industrial Average that quotes what the stock market's done today on the news is an index. Uh, the, best, the best example is the S&P 500. And what that is, is Standard & Poor is a company, S&P, that uh, rates, does all kinds of ratings and research on the stock market. And they have rated the top 500 companies in size on the New York Stock Exchange, which are the largest companies, in other words, mm-hmm. uh, the, pu- the largest publicly traded companies in America. So those 500 companies, uh, what their stock does really does represent in a very real way what the stock market is doing. That's an index fund. Okay. You, you could get a, uh, an index fund that is trying to measure or, or mirror some of the international markets or some of the small cap stocks, like on the Chicago uh, Exchange. But the most commonly known one that they would be referring to in that would be something like an S&P 500. Now, so if, that, if, that fi- if those 500 stocks are the index, or if you want to index to them, rather, they're the measuring stick, what we're trying to do if we're creating an S&P 500 index fund is we're trying to create a fund that mirrors what those stocks do as a group. It may or may not hold all 500 of them, but they're doing their very, very best to do exactly what that index does with that mutual fund. Okay. So an S and P 500 fund is really going to give you pretty close to the exact rate of return that the stock market gives you. Not any better, not any worse. As a matter of fact, it's considered the baseline when you measure against it to see if another type of mutual fund is outperforming the market. You see what I'm saying? That's considered the 1.0 on a beta, meaning it's the baseline. And and if your fund, if you're graphing it, if the line on your fund's growth is above the S&P, then it's outperformed the market. If it's below the S&P, it's underperformed the market. Okay? A large number of mutual funds underperform the market. But there are plenty of them that overperform, that outperform the market. And, and so uh, uh, the, the problem with the PBS special is this. The number one reason people retire with no money is not because of rate of return. Okay. And it's not because of the fees. It's because they don't put any freaking money in retirement. That, and we've got tons of research that shows that. And all of these guys who start ripping on fees or worrying about the 401k structure or, or, you know, from a liberal political perspective, try to figure out what's wrong with America today and that capitalism is somehow bad or something. And they've got that as their undercurrent in a lot of these things. You're never allowed to charge a fee for anything in their minds. Um, and, and it is the undercurrent and it is PBS. So we know that's there. But aside from that, the the truth of the matter is that the research indicates that getting people to invest is the primary thing you do first. The second thing you do, if they want to win, is the rate of return that they make on their money. The last thing that's an indicator of whether they end up with money is fees. Well, I listen to your show, and it, I mean, it tells me I need to be in the. I mean, my work has the four hundred one k with a match, yeah. and your show tells me that's where I need to be. Yeah. And I've heard you mention there's four different kinds of mutual funds, yep. all, you yep. know, related to risk and re- and, and return. Yep. Um, so I guess I'm asking. So and the, so the last part of the question is, do I think it's okay? Let me finish the one last thing there. If the main reason people don't have money in retirement is because they don't put any money in, how do you solve that? You make it easy to invest for retirement. Payroll deduction 
is the easiest way, if we're talking about philosophy, to get people to do anything. That's right. why the IRS gets away with taking as much of our money as it takes, and we act like it's okay. Because if you had an IRS guy standing at the front door and you had to hand him cash as you walked out every day out of your money, you know, there'd be a, there'd be a dadgum revolution with what we pay in taxes. But we're all right. dumbed down by the payroll deduction. The 401k allows that same automatic way to do that. So, it, so I'm a fan of the 401k philosophically for that reason. Now, do I put money in my 401k? Yeah, I put money in my personal 401k. Is it the only thing I do to build wealth? No, it's not the only thing. But it does keep the government's hands off the taxes, keep off the money for taxes. And if it's a Roth IRA, a Roth 401k, it's growing tax-free. And yes, I recommend four types of growth stock mutual funds. None of those were index funds, by the way. Growth, growth and in income, aggressive growth, and international. Now, in some 401ks, the selection of funds that you're looking at is so bad that, that your growth fund category could be filled with the S&P 500. Your aggressive growth could be filled with a Russell index, which is the aggressive growth index um, fund. If there's an index fund in there, that's fine. I'm not against that. Um, but look at your mutual funds inside your, that you have the opportunity to select. And in every mutual fund perspective, there's that S&P trend line, baseline, and then the trend line of the growth on your particular fund. And you can see if the fund you're looking at has a track record of underperforming the market. If it does, don't use it. Use an index fund. Right. You know? But Let me ask you this. Are all mutual funds managed so all mutual funds have those different levels of fees? No. Well, there, there's no load funds and there's loaded funds. All mutual funds have some fees. A no load fund means no commission. That's what that means. But it has a maintenance fee. And the maintenance fee comes out every single year. The commission comes out only at the beginning. So what you're looking at is not uh, if they have fees. You're looking at the what's called the expense ratio. When you look at the prospectus, you can look at that. And you want to look at it averaging over 10 years. What's the average annual expense from all the fees? They're lumped into that one ratio in, the, in your prospectus. And it, it's, it's federal law. It has to be in there, okay? Um, and you're looking at that. Here's why you look at that. Let me give you an example. This is a great call, by the way. Thank you for asking these questions because it's real helpful to teach everybody this. Um, on a no-load fund, there's no commission, but they charge an annual maintenance fee. Now, if they charge an annual maintenance fee that's 2%, and they do that over 10 years, then their average is going to be 2%, where a loaded mutual fund with a commission might have a 5 and 3 quarter percent most of them do, commission on the front end when you buy it. And then the maintenance fee might be 0.5 or 0.6. And when you run that math out, it's going to be cheaper than a 2% annual maintenance fee with no commission over a 10-year period of time. So your expense ratio can be cheaper with a loaded fund. Your total expenses you're paying over a 10-year period of time can be cheaper than a, than a no-load fund. Uh, but it's not always so. So if you're real concerned about expenses... Then you look at that expense ratio, and it, it's, the, uh, it's the true up. It's how you compare apples and oranges between a commissioned fund and a non-commissioned fund. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And so you look at the average through there. But here's the thing. Listen to this. If your expenses are up 1% higher average over a 10-year period of time, but you make 4% more rate of return, you came out. <laughs> I can do that. I can do that. That's why, that's why return is your primary measure of which you of how you pick a fund that's your primary measure you, the last thing i look at is expenses and very seldom do i find expenses being the deal breaker and, and you know that's the reality that's not theory that's the reality good question Thank you.